Hello and welcome to this second part in design patterns uh, for the course software engineering. In this part, I will cover some of the structural patterns, uh, specifically adapter, bridge and facade. If you want to read more or learn more about the other patterns, you can look them up online. So structural patterns deal with how classes and objects are composed, uh, how they form larger structure and why you would like to use these could be for making your code more flexible, more modifiable, um, making it easier to read, etc. There are two different kinds of uh, structural uh, patterns. So there are class patterns which use inheritance um, and we'll get into the importance and, and differences uh, when I talk about the adaptive pattern. Uh, the other kind is uh, object patterns, and basically they use aggregation and composition uh, to realize new functionality. So the adapter uh, pattern is used when you have some form of interface mismatch. So imagine you bought a third party software or, or component, and you want to integrate that into your own software. So there might be software interface mismatches, um, but you still want to get it to work somehow. So what you can do, if you look at the class adapter, um, it uses inheritance, as I mentioned before. Um, and so you basically inherit um, the adaptee in this case, that is the third party product uh, interface. And then you adapt or, and then you implement the interface for your own software, the target. In this case, you see uh, the third party product has a specific request and my own just has a request. Um, I'll show you this in code. So imagine you have some form of position device and I need to integrate it to my own system. So look at the top right box, the other position device. It has a method called position request that is mismatched towards my own, the pool position device, which has a method called get position. Looking at the code then, uh, using a class adapter, basically I create my position device, I extend the other position device, meaning I am still um, classified as an other position device, so to speak. Uh, and then I implement my own interface. Um, so then I just use the inheritance features or the functions like using the super uh, to call the position request. And then I can return uh, the position in, in accordance with my own interface. The benefit of using a, a class adapter is that I can override some of the behavior of the third party, or in this case, the other position device um, functionality. I can also still act as, I was, as if I was another position device, like the third party device. So if if I still need to pass things along, I need to pass um, my own interpreter along with uh, and use it with a third party system somewhere that is still possible because I extend that behavior. Okay, going on to the object adapter. So using um, composition here. So we have a specific adaptee again, it has a specific request and I create an instance of that adaptee, and then still adapt uh, to my own interface. Looking at the code, we still have the same uh, example. And in this case, I don't extend the other position device, I just implement my own interface, the pool position device. That means, of course, I need to create an instance. So I have a variable here called uh, other position device, uh, or it's of type other position device, and I call it other position. And I create an instance of that somewhere in my code. And then when I call this get position method or function, I just uh, call that uh, position request method uh, or function on uh, that instance I have of the other position. The benefit of using an object adapter is of course that I can adapt to several different types if I have um, several different types of positioning system. I could create instances of each and every one of these. I can have uh, several um, the instances of the same, perhaps. Uh, meaning it's a bit more flexible in that sense, but I cannot act as the original type anymore. So I cannot act as um, 
other position device anymore. So those are the consequences. Class adapter, um, I can create a, uh, commit to a concrete adapter class. I can still act as that type and I can override some of the behavior. Object adapter, um, I can work with many adaptees. I can work with many part third party systems, um, but I, it's more difficult to override the behavior and I cannot act as the original type. Continuing with bridge, so the bridge pattern has some similarities with the abstract factory in that you have some general code you would like to keep and then have some, some parts that have several different implementations. Uh, so it is possible to use inheritance here, um, but um, the general code would have to go into each subclass, so it might not be as flexible. So the solution is, of course, to decouple the code and create some part that is general and some part that has the different implementations. An example, or starting with the UML then, um, so we basically have uh, an implementer and we have concrete implementer A and B and um, some form of, of uh, refined abstraction that we want to use. Looking at an example then, uh, it could be that we have some form of application that should run on different types of systems. And when we adapt it to um, desktop computer, we have a certain resolution, we have a keyboard, we have a mouse. If you use a mobile phone, we might have different input capabilities. We might need to reduce some of the power interfaces or we might need to do some of the features differently. Maybe the behavior is slightly different and so on. Uh, typically on a desktop computer you wouldn't like have the tilting feature while on the mobile phone you need to consider both landscape and um, portrait mode etc. So instead of making two completely different applications we can be basically just use the bridge pattern. So uh, giving you just some code we have some abstraction with some general operations um, some general code and then we have this operation X uh, so whatever operation that is specific. Uh, I have this interface. So again, we use polymorphism um, here. So the, imp the uh, interface, the implementer here has this operation X simple that we call from our abstraction. And then I basically have a concrete implementer A and a concrete implementer uh, B in uh, the D section and E section respectively. So basically, I can use polymorphism to swap, swap between these easily. Um, and it's, as you see on line A14, I can get which implementation I'm using at the moment. So I can basically just do um, get whatever operating system I'm on or get the device ID or something like that. And from that, there I can get um, which actual instance I'm using, either A or B. So the consequences, of course, I'm going to decoupling interface and implementation, make it more flexible so I can reuse certain parts and then just have specific implementations for other part. Um, that also improves the extensibility, of course, and I do hide the implementation from the client, so I just reveal the interface. Okay, going on to the next pattern, facade. So the facade pattern is uh, to help create a uniform uh, interface. This is especially useful when you have a very complex system, a very complex module, for instance, many classes communicating with each other, and um, you don't want to expose that complexity to uh, the developer or the user. So um, you just want to simplify the subsystem, you want to make it easy to reuse. This is very helpful when you're, re you're releasing APIs, etc., to have a facade class where you can just go and look. So. Um, this is um, an example where you don't have used, where we haven't used the facade. So basically, you have different clients, they want to access different parts of your subsystem or the module, and they all have to uh, understand how everything fits together. They need to communicate with each and every one. If we introduce a facade to this example, we basically have a facade that um, gathers and aggregates all the functionality, meaning you can have documentation in one place, making the subsystem a little bit easier to understand. You only need to really understand the facade class. And even if you do have this facade, you don't uh, prove, you don't uh, hinder uh, the use of a specific class either. As you can see in client 4, it can still access the subsystem behavior uh, separately. 
So a short example here. Uh, so we have a client, we have uh, facade class one and two, um, and then to do certain operations. So this is without using a facade. Uh, so we had different class classes uh, which want to run operations in each and one of these. Uh, if we were to use a facade, then we create we just create an instance of uh, the facade, and then you can operate or run operations on on the just the facade. So you don't need to know about class one and two in this case. You don't need to know about the subsystem at all here. You can even simplify it um, if you always want to do um, operation one and two after each other, you can actually simplify that in your facade and aggregate those into a facade operation that performs both of these access, or that accesses both of these uh, classes. So um, the consequence, of course, with facade is that you shield uh, the clients from the subsystem. You can simplify the interfaces and so on. And it does provoke, uh, promote weak coupling because um, you um, uh, you, well, you you simplify the the sub or the, the the aggregate the subsystem, meaning that the module itself can uh, can change um, as long as the facade prefer, uh, provides the same functionality, as long as it has the same API and so on. Then you can make change, changes in the module itself. But it doesn't prevent any use of the subsystem classes if you really need to. So those were some of the examples of structural patterns. And thank you for this time. And the next lecture will contain some examples of behavioral patterns.